You talk, do you want to speak to the podium mic and your slides are right there. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. My name is Deepak Mishra. I represent uh, Georgia Coastal Ecosystem LTER. Uh, also in the room, uh, Mariel Albers, Steve Pennings, project directors, and Amanda Spivak. Um, site news, uh, so we are in the planning phase for uh, GCE 5, 5, which is, uh, you know, we call it GCV or variants. Uh, we're looking at variants, <laughs> uh, time series, uh, you know, variants of ecosystem driver response. Um, Amanda uh, Spivak would be transitioning to uh, be the new pro project director midway through the next uh, round. So um, in terms of uh, spatial scaling at GCE, we have a fairly large remote sensing geospatial group, working group, and uh, most of our efforts have been, uh, you know, basically integrating the ground observations to satellite observations to see if we can go beyond the sensor deployment sites or flux towers and things like that uh, by combining existing data producing infrastructure like PhenoCam, flux tower, uh, permanent plots and instruments, other instruments on the site, uh, and emerging technologies like AI and uh, edge devices and things like that. Um, we have been able to model and anal analyze new biophysical parameters, which cannot be directly sensed from satellite data necessarily. Uh, um, so they, they are linked to satellite data through proxy variables, environmental drivers, but they're not being sensed by the sensors. So some examples I'll show uh, are basically uh, listed here, inundation dynamics, below ground biomass. Um, there's something called emergent leaf area index. Uh, we have done some work on that. And then we're also trying to uh, look at uh, quantum efficiency of water system two in Spartina. A lot of these are uh, pieces of puzzle for going towards the carbon budget, like in terms of G uh, modeling GPP across spatial scale for the uh, site and beyond. So uh, here is one example of uh, flooding dynamics and frequency detection. So uh, a lot of ecosystem function in marshes are you know, dominated by tidal flooding. So uh, one of the things that we don't have control over is when the satellite overpasses and uh, what is the condition of the site. So if it happens to be a flooded scene, uh, the tendency is to discard it, but there are uh, information that we can use so uh, we have been working on uh, developing models to detect uh, uh, pixels that are flooded, non-flooded, moderately flooded, things like that. And uh, here is a monthly, uh, you know, like uh, images of Landsat that shows how the flooding dynamic changes across months. And then you can composite it to look at long-term tidal flooding. Uh, the newest product is, you know, we can, you know, apply it to Landsat and then scale it uh, across like from 80s to now and then look at all those red lines. Uh, so flooding dips, you know, any vegetation indices, you know, the dip uh, that indicates flooding, and then you can flag them, you can remove them if you want, and then create this kind of smooth uh, vegetation plots for your other you know, model input. Uh, so the two resolutions, two papers and two resolutions on MODIS and uh, Landsat uh, uh, shown here. Then you can take those flooding information and then you can use it for satellite-based modeling for biomass uh, above ground or below ground. Uh, obviously satellites don't measure below ground biomass. Uh, so you know, we have done some modeling to look at uh, how we can use proxy variables to model below ground biomass. Here is a spatial map of that. And it shows that uh, areas with the low elevation, poor drainage uh, are seeing a heavy decline in below ground biomass in the last five, uh, in the five year uh, period of change detection we measured. And uh, so some of these things are you know, not necessarily new, but it's interesting to look at them through spatial uh, scale. Uh, other things, some of the new work is uh, uh, emergent leaf area. So when the tidal flooding covers the canopy, uh, little uh, you know, canopy a leaf area changes. And if the satellite image happens to be in a floody, flooded day, then you know, that leaf area is much lower than the leaf area of the entire canopy on a dry day. So I've done some mapping of the, our modeling of the leaf area, how it changes within the flux tower. The idea is if we can model it within the flux tower, we can go beyond the tower and then use the satellite data sets and the flooding days for uh, GPP uh, modeling. Another one is where, this is some new work we're doing uh, for heavy deployment of ground sensors, uh, diving PAM fluorescence meters. Uh, you can see those and then studying the diurnal variation of photo, uh, photosystem two efficiency. And then the idea is to uh, develop a ground up uh, fluorescence model because we don't have sun induced fluorescence data set for wetlands. So, you know, 
So we, uh, we want to see how can we go beyond the flux tower footprint to, uh, to use this kind of you know, SIF GPP model that they use for terrestrial system, but for coastal system using PS2 or electron transport rates and uh, GPP. So that work is, and they can see a kind of spatial prediction of uh, PS2 across the flux tower type. Yeah, so challenges, uh, my challenges are similar to everybody else's. So mentioning things and sensors, equipment, and the impact, I don't make the last point very clear that these are some of these uh, uncertainties we have in the satellite-based scaling up of uh, carbon budget to, uh, to uh, within the domain. And uh, so we are trying to address those through, uh, you know, these specific uh, experiments and models. Thank you. Sorry.